Can everyone hear me? All right. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us for the third week of our virtual Bahamas Natural History Conference. This week's top topic is fish for the future, and we are featuring long-standing marine scientists that have dedicated their lives to conservation, research, and influencing policy in the fisheries industry in the Bahamas. As we know, fisheries is the third largest industry in the Bahamas with fisheries exports contributing more than 50 million per year to the economy. In a country that's 90% water, it should be no surprise that fishing is both important to Bahamians culturally as well as economically, employing more than 9,000 people nationwide. Many people, particularly those on family islands, rely on fisheries resources for their income and self-sustenance. However, our fishery stocks have been degraded over the years. Poor fishing practices, loss of reef cover, and even climate change has led to decreased populations of important fish products such as groupers, lobster, and conch. Our first speaker is Dr. Lester Gittens, a fisheries officer who has been with the Department of Marine Resources for 18 years, and he will be presenting on size selectivity and bycatch mortality of lobster and other taxa in Caceres um, compared to traps in the Bahamian lobster fisheries. Let's welcome Dr. Gittens. Okay, good afternoon, one and all. Thank you for being here for my presentation. Yeah, so sustainability in fisheries is very important. There are a great many things that influence this sustainability. And today my focus will be on some of the broader ecosystem aspects of fishery sustainability. I'll be focusing on bycatch in the Bahamian lobster fishery. And so I'll be giving some background information, share some pertinent hypotheses that I tested, the results and the conclusions. Now, as I stated before, sustainability is influenced by many factors. They're biological factors, economic and social, but my focus will be on some biological aspects of fishery sustainability today. And in particular, I'll be focusing on the casita that you see on the left and traps that are used in the Bahamian lobster fishery on the bottom right. Now, what exactly do I mean by bycatch? I think most persons understand that bycatch refers to other species that are caught by fishermen that they were not targeting. But if you look through the literature, it can also include um, non-targeted size classes, or in other words, the undersized organisms that you did not intend to catch. So my definition for today is all non-target taxonomic groups, non-target size classes, and other species that fishers retain but would not catch if they were not fishing for the primary species. And just to be clear, the Caribbean spiny lobster is the species I'm speaking about. In the Bahamas, this is known as the crawfish, but thank goodness for scientific names, everyone knows or will understand what we're talking about when we say Panulirus argus. So that's the fishery I'm referring to in the Bahamas. Now to give you a bit more background, um, the Bahamian lobster fishery um, is quite significant. We are one of 14 countries that has significant spiny lobster landings, but the Bahamas is responsible for fully one fifth of the region's landings. And up to 2018, the fishery uh, landings were recorded at $47.1 million. And it expands over a very vast area. Most landings come from the Little Bahama Bank and the Great Bahama Bank. That's over 116,000 square kilometers of shallow banks. Now, a lot of persons don't know what is a casita is. It's a six foot by four foot little house, so to speak. That's what casita translates to, 
little house. As you can see here, there's an opening that allows lobsters to enter and leave. They're not restrained in there in any way, but they work really well for this particular species, this um, Caribbean spiny lobster, because they are highly social. Once you have a few under there, others are attracted, and this makes this fishing gear very effective for um, aggregating lobsters. But a lot of persons wonder how you can have bycatch with a casita. So it's not actually the casita itself that causes the bycatch. It's the fishing methods that are used with it. This device you see on your screen is called a lobster hook. Typically, a fisherman would use this hook to pull lobsters from under the casita, or they move the casita and use the hook to snag the lobsters very quickly. But the results could be that you're impaling the lobster and if it's undersized, presumably the fishermen would let it go. But we had no idea before the study whether these lobsters actually survive. So it's important to see that whether these lobsters actually survive if fishermen do what they're supposed to and let them go. So there's a possible bycatch of undersized lobsters. And this leads me to the hypotheses I'll be looking at today. The first one relates to the hooks and that is juvenile lobsters have higher mortality at casitas due to the use of lobster hooks. Um, B, traps have bycatch. There have been no studies on bycatch on traps in the Bahamas, so this hypothesis is simple. I'm just saying that there is bycatch. I'm going to document what that bycatch is through this study. And then C, we have the wooden lathe traps, and casitas differ in the size frequency of lobsters associated with each gear type. And I'll explain why that one is important a little bit later on. And so delving into the first hypothesis, I looked at survival of lobsters when hooked. So what we did, there were approximately 90 lobsters. We hooked a number of them in the cephalothorax, approximately 30, another 30 in the abdomen, and then some were not hooked. We placed them in traps and checked their survival or compare the survival of the different categories of um, lobsters. And our first result for the day, in this kaplan meyer hook injury survival analysis, you can see in the left, the number of lobsters we started with, approximately 30 in, inch, in each case. And for each category of lobster, the ones hooked in the cephalothorax, those hooked in the abdomen, and those not hooked, that's the black dots, there were mortalities by the first day. And then by seven days in each category, we were left with 25 surviving lobsters. And so this result was quite informative. It let us understand that the hooking itself did not necessarily lead to the death of lobsters, which is good. That means it encourages sustainability by utilizing hooks. But what is unfortunate is that with the control lobsters, there were deaths as well, which means by simply handling the lobsters, their death resulted in some cases. So we want to avoid handling lobsters unnecessarily. But this result is also informative for our market as well. Generally, the market prefers tails. So if fishermen want to hook a lobster by hooking in the cephalothorax, avoiding the tail, then that would be better as well. They would get more for their lobster by simply hooking in the cephalothorax. But the more significant result is that simply handling the lobsters can result in mortality. And for those who follow statistics, I'm sure you heard Andy's voice earlier, um, their, their probability result was 0 0.632, which meant there was no difference in survival between the different categories. And so as far as our first hypothesis, the outcome is that hooking did not result in higher mortality beyond what occurs with handling. And then moving on to our second one that sought to document bycatch in the trap fishery. So what we did was place observers on commercial trapping boats and the uh, um, observers recorded the weight of each species that were caught, the numbers of each species, and also the fate. The fate is quite important. So it's, um, it would be much better if something was discarded alive if we didn't want to retain it. It's also great if you retain something and make use of it, at least a balanced harvest. 
But the category really and truly we want to avoid is discarding dead organisms. That's just waste. Uh, some of our results, well, sorry, more of my sampling um, here. This is a map of the Bahamas. And most of the sampling took place towards the end of the year, like February and March. And these are the locations that we were able to sample for the commercial trap fishery. But importantly, the results were quite interesting. We documented 31 species of bycatch. I mean, and the various taxonomic groups from echinoderms, like um, sea cucumbers, we had crustaceans like crabs, and then we also had um, fish, and interestingly, the red lionfish. Now, what really stands out here is the NASA grouper. That is a concern. When the study was done, it was categorized as endangered, and more recently, it's been upgraded, or like maybe you can call it a downgrade, to um, critically endangered. So they are caught as bycatch in the trap fishery, which isn't necessarily a problem if fishermen abide by the size limit and throw them back and we're getting ready to change those size limits as a matter of fact. But another interesting result was that lionfish were present. In case you don't know, the lionfish was, is an invasive species in the Bahamas. And it's wonderful that it turns up in the trap, lobster trap fishery because these traps will actively remove the lionfish. And if the fishermen kill them or retain them, that's better for the fishery. Um, in terms of bycatch, we saw that at each location sampled, uh, just around 25% of traps had bycatch near Key Lobos, around 25% at South Andrus, and near the southern part of the tongue of the ocean, most of the traps, around 80%, actually had some sort of bycatch. So that's, that's in terms of frequency of traps that had bycatch. But importantly, when we look at the weight of the bycatch at South Andros, 30% um, of the weight of the lobster was represented by bycatch. Yeah, the tongue of the ocean, 47% was the bycatch level. So typically you measure bycatch as a proportion of the weight of your target species. But fortunately, we saw that very little was discarded dead. Most was discarded alive, some was retained, but very little was discarded dead. And so you can see the results on your screen, as little as 0.5% near the um, tongue of the ocean. And so our second outcome was that bycatch from traps is not unreasonably high, and it may benefit the ecosystem through um, removal of lionfish. Then our third study or hypothesis looked at the um, size selectivity of lobsters in casitas compared to traps. Now, this is important because you have to depend on fishermen to do the right thing should they encounter undersized lobsters. In the case of casitas, we want to know what is it they're exposed to, what could they retain if they really wanted to, and in the case of traps, the same thing. And so it's important to see what it is that fishers can possibly retain by simply using each gear type. And this result here shows, well, firstly, the dotted line represents the minimum size limit of three and a quarter inches carapace length, or just under 83 millimeters in terms of, um, mil sorry, in terms of metrics. And you can see here that in casitas, there's a very broad size range all the way down to just under 20 mil millimeters. Those are really small lobsters. But fortunately with casitas, the lobsters can go and come. In the case of traps, we can see that a good proportion of lobsters below the size limit is retained. And so you would actually have to depend on the fishermen to remove these lobsters. You depend on them to remove the lobsters quickly when we consider the results earlier about um, lobsters dying simply from being handled. We have to depend on fishermen to remove those, those um, lobsters very quickly. But there's some good in information in here in that those below 61 millimeters wouldn't even be retained by traps. So there's a good and bad in this result. And when we look at the average size of lobsters at casitas, um, they're, they're statistically, there's a statistically significant difference in that at casitas, there were 71 millimeters on average, or the mean size. 
traps, they were a lot larger, 79. So on average, they're pretty close to the minimum size limit of around 83 millimeters in, in traps. But uh, another important result was that when you look at the legal sized lobsters, so if you're out there trying to get legal sized lobsters, there was no difference in success rates at getting those size limits, sorry, at getting those lobsters. In Casitas, um, 1.78 uh, versus traps where it's 1.74 uh, um, legally sized lobsters. So either can be used to target legal sized lobsters. And so that brings us to our third outcome. Traps are more selective at um, catching lobsters. They don't retain those really small ones, but you have to depend heavily on fishers once they get the traps on board to return those undersized or those sublegal lobsters to the water. And so overall, my concluding comments or summary was that hooking did not result in higher mortality beyond what occurs with handling. And I discussed the implications of that. You really have to still minimize handling unnecessarily, but using hooks didn't mean that lobsters will die if a fisherman releases it. Bycatch occurs in the trap fishery, as we would expect, but it wasn't unreasonably high. In particular, when you look at the, the, the what is discarded dead, very little is discarded dead. Um, as I just recently said, traps are more selective, but dependent on fisher behavior. But the um, traps have a risk that must be monitored and mitigated in that our sampling was very limited in range and the time of year. So it's still something we need to investigate further. There were NASA grouper, so we do have to monitor the fishery. And I did present these results here. Lobsters at traps are generally in poorer health. I present this at the last Bahamas Natural History Conference. This was a chapter in my dissertation that focused on it, but I won't delve into it. But that, this fed into my conclusion that traps have a risk that must be monitored and mitigated. And other results, survival of lobsters, juvenile lobsters was no different at casitas versus natural habitat. And remote sensing can actually be used to detect casitas and has the potential to, potential to enhance management in the Bahamas. And so, Thank you very much for listening. A great many persons contributed to this work. My lab at Old Dominion University, my super PhD supervisor, Professor Mark Batu, is now at Florida International University. The Ministry of Agriculture and Marine Resources stepped up big time. The Bahamas Marine Exporters Association and my wife and kids and other volunteers um, took part in this research project. That was a major, a major part of my dissertation. So thank you very much for listening. Excellent. Thank you, Dr. Gittens, for that wonderful presentation. If you're just joining us, welcome to the um, virtual installation of the Bahamas Natural History Conference put on by the Bahamas National Trust. And my name is Mrs. Jewel Thompson Benaby, and I'm a science officer here at the Bahamas National Trust, and I will be continuing to moderate this session for you all. Up next, oh, also, if you're just joining us, just to let you know, we will be having a question and answer session at the end of all presentations. So if you're joining in via Facebook Live Watch, YouTube Live, or here on Zoom, be sure to, to put in your questions in the comment box, and we will get to those during, during our question and answer session. So we'll look forward to reading those and getting some feedback on that. Up next, we have our second speaker, who is Dr. Krista Sherman. She has a long-standing dedication to researching NASA grouper throughout this country. Her topic is population genomics and acoustic telemetry of NASA grouper reveal fine scale population structures and origins of aggregators. So Krista, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Jewel. Um, can you confirm that you can see my screen? Yes, we can Great. see it. Um, so as Jewel mentioned, I'll be sharing some of the 
the key findings from some work that was published earlier this year. And a huge focus of that work actually used uh, genomic techniques um, to help understand population dynamics of Nassau grouper. Um, and I'm hoping to share how that information can be important from a terms of a conservation perspective. Um, so given the theme for this session is fish for the future, I thought it would be a good start to take uh, by looking back in time at the past. Um, so the evolutionary history of many species, including groupers, has been shaped by both biological and geographical processes. Um, and that often gets translated or reflected into the current patterns that we see. And so for species like NASA grouper, anthropogenic or human threats have also played significant roles in influencing their populations. As Dr. Gittins already mentioned, NASA grouper are globally critically endangered, and they're also an important fishery species in the Bahamas and in parts of the Caribbean. Unfortunately, however, their life history characteristics, coupled with their reproductive strategy, particularly the formation of fish spawning aggregations or FSAs to breed, makes them extremely vulnerable to being overexploited. And of the current anthropogenic threats to Nassau grouper, FSA fishing is one of the biggest threats. Although what we see is that fishers may not realize this is problematic due to hyperstability. So at these spawning sites, fish are concentrated into specific areas for discrete periods of time to breed. Um, so it's easy from one year to the next because of this concentration to retain the same catch over time. But what is actually happening is the population size is actually declining. And there will reach a point where th that particular spawning site is no longer commercially viable. And if it's severely fished, it can actually collapse and no longer form. And actually what we have seen over, okay, and actually what we have seen over the last uh, two decades or the last decade or so is that uh, between 20 to 40% of NASA grouper are being illegally caught during the closed season. Hold on one second for me. Yeah, um, yeah I was just gonna say, I think you okay. need to change the view. Okay, good. All right. So between 20 to 40% of NASA grouper are actually being caught illegally um, during the closed season. Um, so that's problematic. And in order for us to change this pattern of decline, we are gonna need to better coordinate our research and management approaches so that we develop a better understanding of population demographics um, at both small and large spatial scales. So for the first part of this work, I uh, used microsatellite genotyping to determine how genetically diverse and connected NASA grouper populations within country are, and also used this technique to explore whether anthropogenic activities have compromised their genetic health. So for those of you that attended the last Bahamas Natural History Conference, this is a refresher because you've seen this before, but essentially this is a structure plot and what it's showing um, is different uh, locations in the Bahamas. Bimini and Grand Bahama are grouped together here. It's organized geographically from north to south. This is Great Inagua here. Any samples where uh, it was un, uh, it was where we're uncertain where they were collected from because we did have volunteers assisting with collecting thin clip samples from landing sites. We treated that as unknown. Um, and then this is the Hail Mary fish spawning aggregations here. So each of these uh, bars represents an individual fish. So there are 464 individuals here and we used 14 species specific microsatellite markers. The different colors indicate two different uh, genetic stocks. So in this case, we had two. But as you can see, there's genetic mixing that's occurring throughout the archipelago. So no geographic pattern, no clear population structure based on the microsatellite data. So moving on from this, um, I used some modeling to look at temporal changes and effective population size from the present to a thousand generations ago. Um, and essentially what this is showing is that in every location in the Bahamas uh, indicated by these different colors, the Hail Mary spawning aggregation site is here and the Bahamas overall is in black. What you see is that historically these effective population sizes were large and quite stable, ranging from about 110,000 uh, in Long Island to about 315 uh, in Andrus. 
um, but around 400 generations ago. And if you, you do the math and consider um, the time where it takes to, to, to mature, that predates when you have any human occupancy, any fishing activity in the Bahamas. And we saw those declines happening everywhere. And then there was an accelerated decline within the last 150 to 200 generations. Um, so I also looked at more contemporary estimates of effective population size, and those were considerably lower than these historic levels, indicating that we've had drastic reductions in, in uh, contemporary effective population size compared to the, the historic levels, um, and also recent bottlenecking events, as well as these historic bottlenecking events. So based on the microsatellite data, what this indicated, this is just showing a different image in terms of what that genetic composition looks like. Uh, that revealed that NASA grouper within the Bahamas have and are experiencing reductions in the number of breeding individuals that are contributing to successive generations and also to these bottlenecks. So moving forward to build on that work uh, we used restriction site associated DNA sequencing or RADSeq um, as a technique to establish country demographic structure and genome wide uh, assessments of diversity and differentiation. And for those of you that aren't familiar, RADSeq is one of the leading techniques that's used to screen for and genotype single nucleotide polymorphisms, also pronounced SNPs. And essentially what a SNP is, they're prevalent in the genomes of most organisms. Um, and they're basically the result of a single base pair variation or a substitution at a specific point in the DNA sequence like you're seeing here on your screen. Um, so I use this technique uh, because it is useful in terms of being able to increase the genome coverage uh, using thousands of SNP markers versus a handful of microsats like we did uh, for the previous work to improve our capacity to be able to unravel fine scale genetic variation in species that have been shown to have both strong and weak population structure like NASA grouper uh, is indicated NASA grouper has from the microsat data. So for this work, um, I extracted high molecular weight uh, DNA from 96 uh, fin clip samples of NASA grouper. The quality was checked using a gel electrophoresis and a qubit assay. Um, and then that DNA was used to develop RAD libraries. And then the Exeter Sequencing Service uh, conducted the sequencing. Following that, um, <clears throat> we used the bioinformatics uh, software stacks and the associated pipelines for processing the RADSeq data to discover SNPs and for population genetic statistics. So after quality control and filtering, we were left with a final data set that contained about 13,241 SNPs. Um, so what you're seeing here is actually a discriminant analysis of principal components or a DAPC and that's based on 10,031 neutral SNPs, so not assuming any selection. Um, and what this is showing is that Exuma in aqua here and Long Island in gray have distinct separations from NASA grouper from other locations in the Bahamas, including the Hail Mary FSA, uh, which is there in 10. Um, we also conducted environmental association tests, two different tests. Uh, the first one is called latent fax factor mixed models or LFMM. We also conducted redundancy analysis or RDA uh, and that was used to screen for potentially adaptive loci. Uh, we used the RDA from these outlier SNPs to help us be able to see or visualize whether any patterns of genetic structure could be linked or associated with uh, loci that may be under selection. Um, and these outlier loci or outlier SNPs from both the LFMM and the RDA, uh, we then aligned them to the genome for red spotted grouper uh, to look at gene ontology or the functional attributes of those uh, genes. Um, so in the plot that you're seeing, this is an RDA and the percent variation by each axis is shown in brackets. And what you're seeing is that we had um, a total of 16 SNPs that were associated with environmental variables. So maximum current, maximum sea surface temperature, 
minimum primary productivity and salinity. Um, and as you can see here, it seems like maximum sea surface temperature um, as well as uh, current are influencing the northern and southern extremes of the Bahamas, so Grand Bahama and Great Inagua uh, at the top there. We also were able to detect 67 non-overlapping hits that were associated with 58 genes when we did that alignment to the red spotted grouper genome. And those outlier SNPs were, uh, that were possibly under selection were also connected to a range of really important biological and molecular functions. So for example, we uh, detected genes that were linked to osmoregulation, metabolic processes, and uh, muscle differentiation as well. So the observed genetic differences between Exuma and Long Island from the rest of the Bahamas were interesting and quite unique. It was unexpected. But what it suggests is that there may be subtle differences in gene flow that are occurring among NASA grouper from these islands. And without having physical barriers to gene flow in, in the ocean, uh, there are a few probable explanations for the patterns of genetic connectivity that we saw. So the first is varied migration patterns. So we know that NASA grouper are capable of migrating really long distances, uh, sometimes beyond 200 kilometer, kilometers to reach these FSAs to breed. Um, and from some of the previous telemetry work, uh, there also seems to be some site fidelity associated with that. Uh, there are also likely to be intraspecific differences in larval survival. Uh, dispersal as well as recruitment and recruitment. So when you have a uh, NASA group for settling out of the larval stage and recruiting into nursery nursery habit, habitats, that's not necessarily uh, the same from one year to the next. So there is some variability. Um, we also know that uh, densities of NASA grouper outside the Exuma Keyslon and Sea Park are uh, reduced compared to inside the park. There may be divergent selective pressures between islands, uh, but overall these long distance migrations are likely to be more energetically as well as physiologically costly. Um, so they could potentially explain the presence of these outlier SNPs that were associated with osmoregulation, with metabolic processes, as well as muscle function. And they did show links to the environmental variables that we tested. So to summarize, uh, what we did see from using this RADSEQ technique uh, is that we did see an interspecific or fine scale genetic variation in structure within the Bahamas, specifically that separated Exuma and Long Island from the rest of the Bahamas. Um, and using RADSEQ, we were able to detect that there are potential loci that may be associated with uh, selection. In addition to the other processes that were indicated by the microsatellite data analysis, so the historical uh, events as well as the more recent anthropogenic activities, particularly FSA fishing, um, and those all collectively uh, appear to be really important in terms of shaping population structure. Um, we need to do additional work with regards to selection. Uh, I would like to be able to expand not only sample sizes, but geographic and spatial coverage within the Bahamas, and also do some comparisons on a regional level, um, especially once the genome for NASA grouper has actually been uh, developed and annotated. It's a work in progress. Um, it'll also be important to couple that work with biophysical modeling moving forward because we really need uh, a better understanding of where, not only where all the active FSAs are, but from exactly where fish are migrating from to participate in these FSAs and where fish are recruiting to, uh, to be able to, to offer the best uh, recommendations in terms of uh, effective management for this species. And from a conservation perspective, we know that the preservation of genetic variation is extremely important and an important component for mitigating biodiversity loss. And this is something that should be integrated into management moving forward. And with regards to that, we have worked over the last couple of years on developing, and it, it has been developed, a management plan for NASA Grouper. And we've been working with partners in country to try and get um, some aspects of that implemented. And the overall goal of this plan is to promote population recovery and sustainability for the NASA grouper fishery with the specific objectives of increasing 
uh, density and spawning stock biomass, improving our fishery regulations so that they're science-based and offer the best uh, chance of having a sustainable fishery, reducing anthropogenic threats, <clears throat> and maintaining or improving essential marine habitats. It'll also be extremely important moving forward um, that we work nationally and at the regional level um, to address FSA fishing, but also to address illegal, unreported, and unregulated, or IUU fishing, um, because those are major threats to species recovery. Uh, so the fate of NASA grouper and the fate of the commercial fishery in the Bahamas will definitely be shaped by our response to this effort. So with that, I would like to acknowledge uh, the co-authors that were involved in this particular publication. Um, everyone was, that was involved with the project from 2014 to 2017, uh, especially the crew of the Coral Reef 2 uh, and Keith Bamper, all the individuals that assisted with fin clip sampling and all the individuals and organizations that uh, helped to finance this work, particularly the Save Our Seas Foundation and the Life for Key for that Foundation, because um, this genetic work would not have been possible without them. Um, so thank you very much. If you would like to take a look at the full publication, it's available on our website, and you can also learn more about uh, this project and other research programs related to NASA grouper and spawning aggregations there. So thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Dr. Sherman, for sharing that very important and criti well, critically important research on Nassau Grouper in the Bahamas. I would like to share, take this opportunity to share um, the, from our last Bahamas Natural History Conference, um, the Bahamas Natural History book was published, and I'd like to share that with you all now. Can you guys see my screen? All right, so yes, like I said, two, our, two years ago from our Bahamas Natu Natural History Conference, the Bahamas Natural History of the Bahamas book was published. Um, and it is designed as a field guide. It's small enough to carry on trips. It's actually written by experts in Bahamian ecology with contributions by more than 30 other naturalists and researchers. The cover, it covers organisms found in the Bahamas and the Turks and Caicos Islands. It's ultra comprehensive guide of terrestrial and coastal flora and fauna, including species and common names, locations and detailed descriptions. It's 700 plus color photos included and it's available at Logos, Media Enterprises, and all national park offices across the country. And you can also purchase online on Cornell University Press, online book retailers, and of course, Amazon. All royalty benefits the Bahamas National Trust. Additionally, just to remind you, keep the comments and the questions coming into our Zoom Facebook Live, as well as YouTube, YouTube Live, and we'll be checking them at the end of the last presentation. Up next, our third presenter is Dr. An Andrew Coe, who is a senior scientist working for the John G. Shedd Aquarium in Chicago. He has been studying Queen Conk in the Bahamas for some time now, and he'll be discussing scaling patchiness between and within Queen Conk populations in the Bahamas. Let's welcome Dr. Kao. So actually, I'm gonna change a couple of things there. Um, since this is a happy positive conference, I figured I'd talk about a story that we published, um, a paper that we published uh, two weeks ago. And I'm also just a research biologist um, at SHED. I don't know what the senior scientist thing majigger came from. Um, so I'll be talking about Queen Conk on the Key South Bank. Um, and it's most important to acknowledge my co-author on this, Phil, uh, who used this for his master's at the University of Miami. Uh, I'm Andy. My last name is 
cow like the animal moo and we'll be talking about conch uh, so let's get right into it i guess the analog there right is conch are also moving over like in large herds over seagrass beds um, so here's a conch it's an extremely charismatic and adorable animal um, but it's also relatively defenseless. It just has a thick shell covered with algae. They're all familiar with it. Um, and it performs a vital service to the economy of the Bahamas, as well as to the ecosystems um, in this country of islands. It's full of delicious, delicious meat. And it's really easy to harvest, right, because it's relatively defenseless, which means that populations have unfortunately been in drastic decline. Um, so in a review by Alan Stoner uh, last year, two years ago, uh, he clearly showed that there's a strong link between fishing pressure here on the x-axis, which is an amalgamation of depth and distance from a landing port, and conch abundance. Higher fishing pressure, fewer conch. Again, being an optimist, I tend to focus on places and strategies that enhance larger numbers of conch, for example, marine reserves, such as Exuma Keys Land and Sea Park, or in this case, on remote banks, uh, such as the Key Cell Bank. So where is the Key Cell Bank? Well, it's smack dab in between Florida, the Bahamas, and Cuba. It's owned by the Bahamas, it is Bahamian water, uh, and it is a relatively shallow, um, I think its average depth is around seven meters, uh, but extensive area with very little land. I think it covers around 600 square kilometers of space. So how did we visit this and survey it? Uh, we used the Shedd Aquarium's uh, Coral Reef 2, uh, their research vessel, uh, for a journey to the Keysaw Bank in June of 2017. And we ended up um, visiting six different areas distributed across the bank. Um, and we were thwarted from doing anything resembling a uh, straight transect or focusing all of our efforts in one area because shifting conditions, um, in other words, horrible waves and weather and a very exposed bank uh, really limited our survey to areas that were also reachable by um, both beagle fishers and poachers. So we tended to survey areas that were uh, within five to 10 kilometers of the lee behind islands, be it Kisal Island itself, uh, which is over around here, um, or the dumbass caves or dog rocks. Right. Within those six areas, we used uh, live boat scuba dive surveys uh, and searched for Queen Kong. Uh, and what does that look like? Well, when we find a queen conch, we would record the time into the dive, uh, which gives us the rough location of that animal because we have a GPS track of each dive uh, and also measure um, how large the shell of the animal was uh, to provide um, information for population assessment. All right, so what did we find? I'll jump right into it so we have more time for implications and discussion. Um, so here's just a larger map of the area. Uh, in each one of those little dots is a dive survey. Um, if we then look at uh, two of the different methods of analysis we use for this data, I figured that we shouldn't go too much into uh, analysis. If you want that, you can feel free to read the paper um, and it will go into all sorts of detail. Um, but instead, I'll just walk through some of the results, right? So around the island of Kisal itself, which is like you can see the tip of it there um, in this area, we found a lot of conch. Same with directly to the uh, southeast of it, still following the same contour line, lots of conch. And when I say a lot of conch, look at the scale. So this is adult conch per hectare. Um, the breeding threshold is around 56. So a lot of these dives yielded abundances that were at or exceeding a thousand conch per hectare. That wasn't the case in the center. Um, this is also only adult queen conch as defined by a lip thickness greater than 15 millimeters. And since we measured the length and lip of every single one of the nearly 3,000 conch we encountered, um, we were able to, uh, with high fidelity, estimate what was an adult and what was a juvenile. Uh, we found large amounts of conch pretty much everywhere we looked, um, and maps don't do it justice quite as much, uh, but I'll still put it together here so you can see. Um, and 
the rough statistic that you want to know is that we found adult queen conch on more than 80% of our dives. Uh, that is a huge amount. And you do the same thing pretty much anywhere else in the Bahamas, and you are a lot less likely to find these animals. Um, if you look at the overall abundance per hectare here on the y-axis uh, in those six studies areas uh, relative to the minimum breeding threshold of conch, so since conch have to meet together, literally come together to mate, um, you need a high density of these slow moving snails in any given area in order for them to successfully find a mate. Um, and we found very, very high abundances of queen conch, no matter how we examine the data. You'll also note, again, that study areas three and uh, five and six have relatively lower abundances of adult conch, um, but they had extremely high abundances of immature conch. Um, so no matter where we look, we found a lot of conch. It was exciting if you're into finding large numbers of conch. If you think about this relative to the rest of the Bahamas, so just combining together a variety of uh, different surveys throughout the archipelago, um, it, the message really becomes even more clear at how special this area was and how exciting it was to be able to find this much uh, conch. So uh, the Kiesel Bank actually had the highest abundance that had been measured relative to anywhere else in the Bahamas. Since this is Bahamas Natural History Conference, we'll focus on the Bahamas, but suffice to say that it's also the highest abundance in the wider Caribbean that has been measured for the past two decades, with the exception of a comparable abundance on uh, the Pedro Bank of Jamaica, which was uh, monitored every two years by the government via a direct survey, and they made the decision to close that bank in 2015 to legal fishing after uh, abundances start to drastically decline. So who knows what's been happening on Kisal since the survey in 2017, but at the time of the survey, everywhere we looked, we found conch. Why? So if we think about where the Kisal Bank is relative um, to the broader circulation in the Caribbean, um, this is a map of the Caribbean and the current strength um, is stronger in areas that are more yellow and weaker in areas that are blue, okay? If we look at the Key South Bank, you'll notice that um, the average trajectory and trend of the um, Gulf Stream is based, or the Florida current in this area, as it's known, um, basically divides this area in half, right? So Florida is very isolated from the Key South Bank, while the Key South Bank is proximate to Cuba and uh, both of the main Bahamian banks. It also means that this powerful current, which goes, if you follow my mouse, in this general direction, up into a loop current and then back through, could be potentially transporting larvae or any other floating material um, in a, a clockwise direction through the Caribbean. So there's an enduring source of conch larvae to the Keysile Bank from populations in, say, the Alacranes um, or perhaps even off the Nicaraguan rise. Now comes a really busy but important figure. So we're going to start by looking at uh, just the blue, the blue uh, lines. So those are drifters off of the Global Drifter Database. It's a freely available public tool where you can go and look at any um, drifters that are um, deployed by any number of different governments throughout the world uh, to look at ocean currents. And I found a whopping three drifters that uh, went proximate to the Keysail Bank over the past 10 years. And in each case, uh, they exhibited some interesting behavior. They passed near the bank, for example, uh, the, the middle one, the blue jean color one, um, near the island itself, went back and around, and then somehow ripped back to Cuba. Uh, the light blue one was actually deployed off Kisal and uh, went up, looks like it almost bounced off of the Great Bahama Bank near um, Orange Cay and then got ripped up further north. And then the true blue one uh, came from further south in the Caribbean, um, went around really close to the island again, Further south, bounced off Cuba, bounced off the bank, bounced back to Kisal, 
bounced up along, looks like it went near Bimini, got zipped up into the Gulf Stream and ended up coming back around and circling to the Little Bahama Bank. So that was really exciting to see that uh, ocean currents literally carry things in the same manner that they are predicted to carry things. Uh, we then reanalyzed some biophysical uh, models of larval transport specific to the time that conch larvae would spend at sea while they develop um, and relative to uh, larvae that had just been released from key cell in yellow. So all these little circles now come into play and they are just the habitats that we are looking at linkages between focusing on larvae that originated in key cell and went elsewhere. And I just summed it all up um, into a happy little plot up top. So how many of the larvae that started in key cell successfully settled in Florida? Very, very, very little. And that makes sense because of this powerful boundary current. However, what was much more exciting is that key cell managed to self-seed itself. There was a self-recruiting population of conch that was replenishing um, populations on uh, the bank itself that originated from the bank itself. And even more excitingly, conch from key cell reached both the Great Bahama Bank and the Little Bahama Bank. This means that we have a very abundant population of conch on Kisa, right? That's what we found in the surface. Then with context of the oceanography of the area, it is able to then, in theory, supply and replenish stocks in both the Little Bahama Bank and the Great Bahama Bank, which is great news for the Bahamas. Right? So um, you have this strong, high population of conch queen conch that are presumably mating a lot. We found multiple generations of animals, so they are mating, uh, and those offspring are sustaining the population not only in Kisal, but also uh, heading up to Little Bahama and Great Bahama. All right, so how does that fit into the overall story with fishing as well? And for this, we turn to lip thickness. So this is uh, on the y-axis, lip thickness, which is a relative measure of age of a conch, since they grow a thicker and thicker lip throughout their life. Uh, at first glance, there's nothing here that's super exciting other than um, hats off to the Bahamas Natural Trust uh, and the Royal Defense Force for making sure that the Exuma Keys Land Sea Park has the oldest conch in the area. Very well protected, great place to live out a long successful life as a queen conch eating whatever you feel like grazing upon. If we look at that uh, from a different context though, uh, eliminate the Exuma Keys Land Sea Park where it's illegal to harvest conch and just focus on places in the Bahamas where it's fully legal to harvest them, and then look at how far away from Nassau, the presumptive uh, major landing port and processing facility um, was from each of those study sites, a different picture starts to emerge where you see that the average lip thickness is getting thicker and thicker the further you go away from this major fisheries port, which is then suggesting again that fishing is really driving um, the population status in all these different areas that we've been surveying. This was also noted by reviewers who then wanted to take a further look at poaching. So we put together uh, our limited resources simply trolling through media reports in the Bahamas. So from Tribune 242 and the Nassau Guardian between 2010 and 2020 of poaching instances. Um, and we summarize all of that data in this table. And I'll walk you through it. So the most important things to note in terms of area, so just this column, is that the vast majority of this poaching is occurring in the south. Uh, say the Cochino Banks, uh, Ragged Islands, probably ton of the oceans captured in that as well, and the Inaguas, right? So more than half of this poaching is occurring in southern areas. Um, the responsible parties uh, seem to be split into three different uh, nations, right? Uh, with the Dominican Republic having um, a far-reaching grasp that we could find in the media um, in terms of poaching effort. Uh, but encouraging for conch, it doesn't seem that Queen Conch are the primary target. Uh, they were only targeted four times 
um, or mentioned as being the primary target four times uh, in all of the different media reports. So what does this all mean taken together? Well, we have a very, very high abundance of Queen Conch on the key cell bank. That's very uplifting, exciting, especially if you think about the context from the oceanography of the area, where this high abundance could be fueling replenishment of other populations in the Bahamas. And then finally, this area seems to be relatively isolated. It has the second highest average lip thickness, if that is to be an indicator, um, which is, of course, correlated with um, fishing pressure. So as of when we were doing the surveys, it seems to be naturally isolated. It's a longer run and there's still very productive areas to fish and to poach uh, closer to um, the area, the nations that are primarily engaged in that poaching, uh, but for how long? And with that, I'll just again throw out the title for you guys. If you want a copy of it, send an email. Um, thank the uh, crew and team that we had that involved also folks from Brief and the Bahamas Natural Trust and CEI. Um, and yeah, done. Awesome, thank you so much, Dr. Kao. Um, very, very great uh, presentation and information shared on the Queen Kunk. I know we'll, we will have lots of great questions on this topic. Awesome. Thank you so much, Dr. Kao. Um, very, very great. Uh... Sorry, I was having a bit of feedback um, just now. Pardon me. Um, so up next, lastly, but certainly not least, we have Mr. Eric Schneider from the Cape Eleuthera Institute, who will be discussing fish aggregation devices as conservation tools. Let's go ahead and welcome Mr. Schneider. Thanks, Jewel. Um, all right, let's see. Are you able to see my notes or just the title slide there? The title slide there. We okay. can see your slide, yep. Okay, great. Um, so, Thank you for the intro. Uh, my name is Eric Schneider. I'm a research scientist at the Cape Luther Institute. Um, the last BNHC conference, I gave a talk about the stone crab fishery in the Bahamas, so people might uh, remember that. We still have that work ongoing, but today I'm shifting focus a bit to what has turned into my PhD thesis through the University of Glasgow. Um, I'm going to talk about the offshore fisheries in the Bahamas and specifically how fish aggregation devices or FADs play into that and can potentially be used as conservation tools. So for a bit of background on Bahamian sport fisheries, an FAO report in 2016 estimated that about $527 million per year is generated in the Bahamas through recreational and sport fisheries. Now to be clear, this isn't just the offshore fisheries, this is uh, all recreational fisheries, which includes the incredibly lucrative bone fishing industry. Um, and then they further estimated that visitors who are coming to the Bahamas specifically for a fishing trip spend about $1,500 per person per day, which is a pretty incredibly high amount of money um, in the tourism sector. Now for the pelagic fisheries or the offshore fisheries, um, this is heavily seasonal as many of the migratory fish like mahi and wahoo um, come through the Bahamas in the spring. So a lot of the tournaments are focused in the spring and early summer. Now in the Bahamas, we have very little data um, on pelagic fisheries and landings. 
and a lot of times it's just completely missing. And part of this is because there's no reporting requirement for pelagic species in the Bahamas. Um, there are some regulations, so you do need a sport fishing permit and there are catch limits, um, but because of the lack of reporting requirement, we really don't have um, much information on how many fish are caught out of the open ocean in the Bahamas, what they are, uh, and when that occurs. Now, a Smith and Zeller paper recently tried to reconstruct a number of the different fisheries catches in the Bahamas up to 2010. And they estimated that about 8,000 tons of pelagic fish were landed in the Bahamas in 2010. Um, and about 90% of that fishing was done by tourists. So of that tonnage, that could be up to three quarters of a million fish per year if you assume maybe a 20 pound fish, which a lot of these mahi and small tuna are. Um, but I put that in there to note that that reconstructed catch estimate was 2.6 times higher um, than what was reported in the FAO, FAO report of the pelagic fisheries landings for the country. Um, and just to point out that there's just a really big discrepancy because there's not a lot of reliable data on pelagic fisheries catch. Um, now, to the author's credit, they did um, mention the caveat that there was a lot of speculation um, used in creating this estimate with their models, uh, but they used the best information available, um, but we're still left with this situation where we really just don't have a good grasp on uh, pelagic landings. So now how do fads play into this? So a fad or a fish aggregation device is any natural or artificial structure in the open ocean that attracts fish to it. So one example of this uh, is sargassum seaweed, like you can see in the top photo here. Um, any sport fisher knows that if you see a big patch of sargassum seaweed out in the ocean, you're going to fish around it and you're probably going to catch mahi. Um, this could also be artificial debris, like in the bottom photo here, there's an Atlantic triple tail that's hiding inside of this old bucket. Um, but more recently, fads are intentionally deployed as buoys that typically have a GPS tracker on the top. Um, if they're drifting fads or they're anchored to the bottom of the sea to concentrate fish to an area to make them more easy to catch. Um, now, this activity of exploiting this natural behavior has, used by, has been used by fisheries for hundreds of years. Um, and it's very comparable actually to the crawfish fishery that we heard about earlier today. So the lobster condos or the casitas that are put in is basically the same thing as a fish aggregation device. It's an artificial structure that's put in the ocean to increase the efficiency of that catch. Um, now, anytime you artificially make a fishery more efficient, um, it's very important to manage things like catch rates and size limits uh, and reporting to make sure that the fishery does not quickly become overexploited following this new technological development. So a little bit of background on why fish are attracted to structure in the open ocean. The open ocean or the pelagic zone um, is uh, relatively structureless other than what's, what's floating. So this is the um, area away from coastal environments. Now, there's a few theories as to why fish aggregate to floating structure in the open ocean, and it's probably a combination of these theories. Um, so small fish are likely seeking shelter, uh, and larger predatory fish are likely seeking out those, those smaller fish there. So the middle photo here is some little fish tangled up in some sargassum weed. Um, there's a theory called the indicator log hypothesis, which is kind of interesting, that says uh, before humans started putting things into the ocean, the highest concentration of floating objects would have been logs and tree branches just outside the mouth of really big rivers. Now rivers also export a lot of nutrients, which leads to very high productivity zones just outside these rivers. So that theory states that migratory fish passing by would have evolved to associate high levels of these floating objects with very productive foraging grounds and therefore would have wanted to kind of hang around the areas where they find these floating objects. Um, and another theory that there's some evidence behind is the meeting point hypothesis that schooling fish in the open ocean, if they, um, for instance, if a school of tuna is split up during nighttime foraging activities, they'll have a higher chance of finding their conspecifics to reform a larger school uh, if they hang out by a floating object as opposed to just going about swimming in the open ocean. So like I said, it's likely a combination of these factors but it is a very ubiquitous concept and uh, it makes fads a very powerful fishing tool because a lot of different species have a very high tendency to want to hang out around these floating structures. So 
fads contribute in a number of ways to global fisheries. And probably the big, biggest example is the commercial tuna fishery. Um, now, commercial tuna fisheries are often, um, often use per se nets. So a boat with a massive net, they'll deploy fads that just drift around the open ocean with a GPS tracker on the top. Um, and then as you can see in the top photo here, um, they wrap that per se net around the fad and around the whole school of tuna that's underneath the fad. Now estimates um, show that about 100,000 give or take new drifting fads may go into the ocean every year to support this tuna fishing industry. And over half of all the tuna caught in any way in the entire planet is caught using fads, which is a pretty remarkable number. Um, fads are also used on a smaller scale in subsistence fisheries. These are typically anchored to the bottom. So it'll be a buoy or some flotation structure anchored near a reef to congregate reef fish and make them easier to catch. And they also support um, recreational sport fishing economies across the world. Um, and there are several examples in the Caribbean. But pretty much no matter how you use them, fads can be very, very powerful fishing tools. So for a bit of context on fads in the Bahamas, um, there are currently no regulations that I know of at least um, surrounding fad usage in the Bahamas. Um, and we also have very few species specific regulations on pelagic fishing. Um, so for instance, there's nothing to say, um, if you catch a yellowfin tuna, it has to be X amount of inches long before you're allowed to keep it. Um, and there's really just not a lot of published data on fad use in the Bahamas. So how many might be out there, how frequent, frequently they're used. So a lot of this information is actually just based on anecdotal evidence, um, talking to people, what we see. Um, and it seems like the, the fad use in the Bahamas is relatively limited at this point. Um, we don't see a huge number of them. We find them occasionally floating. Um, and one good example is the picture on the right here. This is one of the naval buoys in the tongue of the ocean east of Andros. Um, that's part of the Autec range. Um, so this is a really big, maybe three or four meter wide buoy that's been there uh, supposedly for decades. And in this photo, I mean, you see mahi and silky sharks and triggerfish and jacks around it. Um, so you can really see it attracts a wide range of, of species of fish. And we have ongoing research for the last three years or so um, to try to get an idea of what goes on around a fad in the Bahamas. So just a little bit of an update on some of that research. Um, going into the project, we kept the driving question as, can fads be used as a conservation tool and not just a fisheries tool? Um, so we wanted to design fads that were ideal for research, that would allow us to outfit them with different scientific equipment um, and really loop everything back to how can this be used as a data generating conservation tool. Um, another project we have going on is just understanding the biomass accumulation or the colonization of a fad in the area. So what turns up to a fad when you put it in the water in the Bahamas? Um, we have a couple projects that are in the analysis phase and are ongoing um, to try to get an idea of this question. Uh, we have a long-term video survey on a couple of fads in the Exuma Sound, um, as well as a recently uh, completed biomass <clears throat> estimation survey using an echo sounder or a um, sonar shown in the top photo here to try to get an idea of, again, the accumulation of, of biomass around the fad, how far out that attractive effect might extend. Um, and with our video survey, just really getting baseline information on what species use fad, does it vary um, with time of year, and are there any predictable patterns with it? Um, another project that we are working on right now is um, tracking fish movement around an anchored fad. So around a fad, in theory, you have your target species, which may be tuna, and you have bycatch species, which may be a silky shark, um, things that you don't want to catch. And with these non-selective fishing methods, like a big seine net, um, you incur a lot of bycatch because you're going to capture anything that's um, swimming around underneath the fad. So we have been doing some acoustic telemetry to try to get an idea of how these target and bycatch species move around underneath the fad. If there are any differences in their behavioral patterns that we might be able to leverage to make a fishery more sustainable. So for instance, if we figured out that uh, around drifting fads in the Atlantic, um, yellowfin tuna spend this time of day at the surface and the silky sharks are actually a bit deeper 
uh, or the oceanic white tip that's on this, this photo here. And if you want to try to reduce your shark bycatch, then you should um, target your tuna at a specific depth at a specific time. Um, so we're working on some of these kind of new telemetry techniques to get a bit of a refined idea of how we can make these fisheries a bit more selective, um, kind of at the commercial level. Um, and then more locally, we've just been thinking about different management options. <coughs> um, you know, what the best way to approach managing an emerging fad fishery uh, would be in the Bahamas. Um, and we've come up with a couple of um, ideas and we see some really <coughs> nice conservation opportunities here. Now, fads are being considered um, for inclusion in the new draft of the fisheries bill, which is a really exciting opportunity um, where we could actually get ahead of this stuff. So a few of the points that we've um, thought over are, are a permitting and approval process for bad deployment seems like a great place, place to start. Um, this is a, a good first step in starting to track the use of fads. So are people interested in deploying fads or where they're deploying fads and in what numbers? Um, also maintaining um, a good structural sort of ensuring people um, construct fads so that they're not going to quickly degrade and just turn into marine debris. Um, and then also understanding how this might change fisheries access. So there is some evidence that deploying fads um, can actually change uh, movement patterns of, of pelagic fish in certain circumstances. Um, so one example of this might be if, if a charter company is allowed to deploy some anchored fads in deep water um, far offshore, might they be moving some of these pelagic fish um, further out than is accessible by, by small boats? Um, so just understanding the, the fisheries access aspect to it as well. Um, also including a, a reporting requirement um, would be a really good idea where this could be a, um, an app-based sort of landings reporting situation, um, a way to get fishers involved and actually have people doing fad fishing, um, collecting data for us that we can then turn around and use to bolster um, conservation of these, of these fish stocks. Um, and then imposing some things like size limits for some of these pelagic species that are covered by um, bag limits. So currently you're allowed to retain 18 migratory fish uh, per boat per day. Um, this billfish are completely protected so you have to release them alive. Um, but things like mahi or tuna or wahoo, there's no minimum size requirement for retaining those species. Um, and a great science-based approach to do that is um, setting your minimum size at the size of reproductive maturity, um, which would be something that we could um, look into. And generally speaking, anytime a new fishing development occurs, um, new technology like this kind of comes into popularity, we really want to know how fads work, how they're manipulating the environment around them, and what the effects of their use are. Um, and we hope that we can use the research that we're doing um, coupled with examples from other countries where fads have led to the quick over-exploitation of different fish stocks, but also in other places where fads have been used to bolster food security and effectively manage offshore fisheries, um, and use all of these to ensure the environmental health and fisheries equitability in the Bahamas moving forward. So with that, I'd like to thank everybody that's contributed to this work. Um, Nick Higgs, Candace Britton, and Travis Van Leeuwen for feedback on the, on the talk. Um, BNT um, for hosting the event and uh, a whole host of CEI interns and researchers and students that have um, supported the work along the way. Thank you. Alrighty, thank you, Mr. Snyder, for that excellent presentation. Um, we will now go into the question and answers portion of this presentation. So we got. Alrighty, thank you, Mr. Snyder, for that excellent presentation. Um, we will.
Okay, can everyone hear me? Sorry, I was getting a bit of feedback. I had things running live on both um, platforms. So I think I was getting a bit of feedback. So we will start with the questions. Um, we'll start first with our Zoom questions. Um, so our first question is for, let's just make sure this is I'm getting the right one. So our first question is from Dr. Anselino Davis. Is there an effect on Casita's size on the lobster survival? And I think that's for Dr. Lester Giddens. Yes, there is. There was a study by Eggleston and Lipschitz and company back in, I think it was 1990 was published that showed that smaller casitas had better survival. But that was just one of the many factors that influence survival of casitas, like predation rates, the size, like the height of the, the Dr. casita. Dr. Gittins, can casita. you hear? Yes. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Hello? Okay, yeah, so I, I was saying that casita size doesn't Yes, include, go ahead. Casita size indeed influences survival of um, spiny lobsters. Generally, the smaller ones, casitas that is, um, enhance survival. At least that's what one study found by Eggleston and Lipschitz and, and company. But many factors influence survival at casitas. One of the major things is um, predation rates. Okay, another question from Dr. Davis for you. Um, Mr. Gittin, Dr. Gittins, is could the mortality be attributed to being in the casitas and not the handling of the lobsters? Well, in my study, no, because the lobsters that were um, tested, so to speak, were gathered through traps. Some were gathered through casitas as well, but there was no evidence that it was simply being in the casita but we have some unpublished work that showed that casitas, um, had the lobsters that are found there had very high protein levels as if they were eating much better. And so, I mean, uh, as it is, there's no evidence that at least in my study that uh, being associated with casitas caused any difference in survival. But we specifically tested whether it was hooked, not hooked, or um, whether there was no, no injury whatsoever. Okay, another question. Um, this one is from Mr. Peter Gowdy. And his question is, since we know exactly where the grouper breeding sites are and when, why can't we get the Defense Force to target those areas to stop the illegal fishing? And that's for uh, Dr. Sherman. Thanks. Um, we actually don't know where all of the active spawning sites are. We have reports of where spawning sites are from fishers. Um, some of that was based on just identifying locations on a map. Um, so we're trying to work to systematically verify which of those sites are still active. Um, and that information is being communicated to both the Bahamas Department of Marine Resources as well as to the Royal Bahamas Defense Force to help prioritize uh, where enforcement activities take place because we know this is a huge area to cover. Awesome, thank you, um, Krista. So this is a, another question. Do you believe that a balance of anonymity 
and, genera and generality must exist when presenting scientific data relative to marine areas that are difficult to police or manage. For example, scientific publications of this nature are generally pers uh, pursued by scientists and relative stakeholders. However, public forums such as conferences and press may draw illegal or overharvest activities uh, over harvest activities to zones which may not have been known to laypersons. And that I think was directed more towards Andy's talk, um, but any of the panelists can um, address that. I guess I'll take a first stab at it if I'm on mute. Can you guys hear me? Okay, sweet. Um, well, I, I think very strongly that it's important to be able to provide folks with information and by targeting, um, you know. Yep, we as, can hear you, Andy. As, as the uh, question pointed out, um, yeah, publications are generally produced by scientists as relative stakeholders, uh, but I think that it's important that all results are known to, you know, a variety of people. How much would it piss off the public, for example, if um, some hidden population only known to the government were the grounds to completely close off people going to into an area? That would be met with um, rather horrible uh, backlash, I'd imagine. So I feel very strongly that uh, if you have a positive message and good data to provide, um, it, it, it should be provided to all. Yes, this is Dr. Gittens. I would say that is a concern with regards to what Andy found and with regards to finding NASA group of schools. And so at the end of the day, we have to have the right balance of sharing information and allowing the Defense Force to know where these places awesome. are. Awesome, thank you, Andy. We have another question here, um, and this is from Dr. Megan Davis. And this question is for Dr. Cow. Can you describe more about the conch breeding habitats found at the Kaysal Bank, example, sand, seagrass, depth, um, and current rate? Yeah, sure. Um, I think that actually cut off Lester as he was speaking, though. Um, I don't, did, did you have anything else to say there, Lester? No, that was more or less it. I was saying we need to have that balance with, it, with sharing information and just being transparent at the end of the day being transparent helps us do you have anything else to say there lester no i can get it that was more or less it i was saying we need to have that balance with it with sharing information and just being okay so i think there's some weird feedback going on with the recording perhaps um but i'll i'll answer megan's question too um it was a very interesting area in terms of recruitment. Uh, we were finding juveniles on hard bottom in higher numbers than I'd seen before, uh, but most of the Keystone Bank is made up of, um, you know, we've had a lot of just sparse, medium, dense seagrass uh, with the typical Gorgonian plains at the edges um, and some coral reefs. Uh, depth was, you know, throughout most of the bank, the places that we went, again, were relatively shallow. Um, but around seven meters. Uh, the currents were relatively wind-driven um, and there wasn't as much of a tidal stream as uh, expected. So pretty much you would pick a direction and swim that way and you didn't really have as much current as you'd have, say, in between islands of um, the Exumas. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Andy. And pardon me for the feedback that's happening on my end. Um, and sorry about that, Dr. Gittens. We do have another question. Um, and this is from Mr. Peter Murray. 
Um, and it's with regard to Kunk. How do the results presented inform us via the Bahamas perspective in light of the US EPA and the issue of whether the species is listed as in danger, endangered under the act? Um, I think for that question, you have to think about the total range that the animal wants had uh, and the potential abundance that it had throughout that range. So if you find a small pocket where there is um, a thriving population, uh, overall the impact and the absence of that species um, throughout the Caribbean relative to the past is what I would think they're probably focused in on more. It's like uh, for a bad analogy, if you found a small pocket of you know 40 tigers somewhere, would that make tigers a, um, considered for not endangerment anymore? Okay, thank you. Um, and this question is from Ms. Anessa Lundy for Dr. Cow. Did you notice much debris in the area of Quesal Bank as well as Kunk? Um, and was there any tissue samples taken from the Quesal Kunk to facilitate population genetics work? Uh, we did not take any tissue samples as we did not have a collaborating geneticist at the time point. Um, and now I think that gap is currently closed. Um, with regards to debris, um, on the island itself, there was a lot of wreckage, um, like old airport and stuff, in the water around Quesal. I think uh, you would find a very large mixture of um, trash as well as cracked conch shell. Um, and in fact, there was a, another vessel relatively proximate to us on, I don't know, night one or two when we were near the dumbass Ks. Um, and our captain has an extreme fish sensitivity in terms of smelling it. And he noted that it smelled like someone was drying fish on the other boat. All right, the next question is from Mr. Mark Boardman. Um, and his question is, which catch method is easier for fishers? traps or casitas and that's for dr giddens well that's a very difficult one to answer um i would say casitas are easier in that you more or less if you find a good spot you place it there and the lobsters will come when you when you go back to it you'll find lots of lobsters whereas traps you have to find bait in some instances you have to deploy them you have to reel them back in but the casitas once they're there, if you find a good spot, it's a matter of revisiting the, the location. So I would, I would suspect that fishermen would say that that's an easier fishing method, but there are other social aspects with persons knowing where your casitas are and visiting them to retrieve your lobsters, quote unquote. So it's not so simple to answer, but overall I would say casitas are a little easier. All right, another question from Mr. Mark Boardman, and this is, is there any indication that the groupers from the park seed other sites? And that's for Dr. Sherman. Uh, that's a good question. Um, so we have additionally, in addition to the genetics work, um, done some acoustic telemetry. Um, and so based on that work, we know that grouper from the park are migrating outside of the park um, to spawn. Uh, we haven't done any larval uh, physical modeling or anything like that yet. Um, but you know, it's likely that grouper from the, from the Exuma Keys Land and Sea Park are gonna be contributing to other areas as well. Um, but that's, that's work that still needs to be um, performed. All right, another one for Dr. Sherman. And this one says, any insights on whether sharks are eating Nassau groupers? Our sharks in Exuma have higher mercury compared to Nassau. Uh, we have not observed any evidence uh, over the last 10 years of sharks um, eating Nassau grouper during the spawning season. I know um, in some other uh, places like in the Pacific where they have large uh, fish spawning aggregations, they have um, observed some um, predation, but that's not something we have seen. 
We do, however, see sharks at some of the spawning aggregation sites, including really large bull sharks, um, but I have not personally uh, witnessed that yet. This one here is from Dr. Nicholas Smith, and this question is for Dr. Gittins. Relative to other fisheries, is 30 to 47% bycatch high or low? Which species make up the majority of bycatch by numbers and by weight, and are bycatch from the lobster fishery recorded by fisheries officers at landing sites? She, her last question there is, why is bycatch so high near the tongue of the ocean um, and is, is it because there are simply a larger abundance of diversity of species near the tongue of the ocean than in other areas? Wow, I hope I can remember all of those questions, but to answer the last one first, we did investigate diversity near the southwest portion of the tongue of the ocean, but certainly that would be one of the factors that would influence bycatch. And this is why we need to investigate further. We know that there is variability. The southwest tongue of the ocean and the other parts that we surveyed, there was a huge difference in bycatch. So we know we need to do more studies. And can you remind me some of the other questions, please? Oh, so the question was, um, relative to other fisheries, is 30 to 40% bycatch high or low? which species make up the majority of bycatch by numbers and by weight, and are bycatch from the lobster fisheries recorded by fisheries officers at landing sites? Yeah, so that, I, I would consider that bycatch um, relatively high compared to other fisheries. But um, in this case, you have to bear in mind that bycatch is um, weighed, so to speak, in comparison to the weight of the target species. And th these studies were done towards the end of the season where lobster catches were greatly suppressed. But nonetheless, to answer your specific question, I'd say that is relatively high. But at the end of the day, you have to um, really look at what the outcome is for that bycatch. Is it returned to the sea alive? Is it discarded dead? I mean, to all those different things. But right now, officers do not record bycatch. I mean, uh, uh, at the end of the day, we don't have officers at sea um, observing vessels. We know a lot of the bycatch is returned to the sea. But that is one of the things that we are um, hoping that we can expand our data collection efforts towards. Um, so the last bit of that question for Dr. Gittins um, from Dr. Nicholas Smith is, why is bycatch so high near the tongue of the ocean? And is it because they are simply a there are simply a larger abundance and diversity of species near the tongue of the ocean than in other areas? Yes, yeah, so I, I answered that question first. And the answer is, in short, uh, I don't know. But that normally is one of the factors as to why there would be higher bycatch, that there's a greater um, abundance of, of whatever the species are. There's also variability throughout the year as well. So it, I believe um, further investigation is warranted. I saw a question asking what our follow-up research would be like in the chat. And so, yes, that's one of the things we need to investigate, this variability and the amount of bycatch across a broader cross-section of the, the fishing grounds. All right, thank you for that, Dr. Gittins. Um, we also have for Mr. Eric Snyder, a question from Mr. Donald Duncan. How can the Bahamas change the dynamics of the tonnage attributed to the tourists in such a way that it becomes more beneficial? Yeah, so I think you're referring to the, the statistic I put up of about 90% of the offshore fisheries catches is by tourists. Um, and I think actually changing the statistic would be a difficult thing because that really boils down to human behavior for one who's interested in going out, but then also, for instance, I live in South Aludra, it's really an access thing. Um, a lot of the fishers around us here don't have the boats um, to get out offshore or don't want to target those offshore fish. So I think because if you can't change that 90% statistic, you just need to make sure the, the offshore fisheries here are a huge asset to the Bahamas. 
Um, so the best thing we can do instead of trying to change that number, that percentage, would be make sure the management and the regulations around those fisheries are beneficial to the country. So I look at the, the bonefish fishery here, I think is, is well managed and is a great example of a catch and release fishery for, if you're not Bahamian, you have to release bonefish and it generates like $150 million a year for the Bahamian economy. Um, so that's something that, you know, you can look at the, the value of it in the money that's spent going after that fish and not necessarily who is actually retaining the fish. Um, so I think just good, good management around it, you can still look at it as an asset, even if it's um, tourists that are doing most of the, the actual catching. All right, this question is also for Dr. Gittins. Are your results from your presentation published as yet? And if so, where? Well, the presentation today, it's not published, but we're working on that. That should be later this year or early next year. Uh, for other aspects of my dissertation, it was in Bulletin of Marine Science. But if you can't wait to see all of the other chapters published, you can go to Google and search for Lester Gittens, Old Dominion University, and my dissertation should come up. This question is for, this next one is for Dr. Sherman. How were you able to determine the 20 to 40% of groupers are caught illegally outside of the fishing season? Is that statistic based on fishers that were caught, fishes that were caught fishing illegally or is it the estimated produce, is it or is it the estimate produced some other way? Thanks, Jewel. Um, so I think what you're referring to is when I said 20 to 40% of NASA group are caught illegally during the closed season. So one of the things that we do when we're monitoring these um, FSAs is to also quantify um, and document uh, fishing activity. Um, and as you know, the grouper, the close season for grouper runs between December and February. Uh, we primarily have been monitoring these sites between uh, December and January and in some special instances have been able to do that um, a little bit earlier, earlier and later. Um, and to do that, we're documenting the number of boats, uh, the number of uh, fishing traps that we see as evidenced by surface floats. Um, and then underwater, we're also counting the number of fish that we see in traps. Um, so using that information relative to the number of fish that are outside traps, you can get a bit of a sense on uh, what um, the fishing pressure is and how many fish are illegally being caught at the sites that we're monitoring during the closed season. Great. This next question is for Dr. Cow. Do juvenile and adult queen kong generally inhabit the same areas? Uh, that is, is there any evidence of an ontogenetic shift in habitat use for queen kong? Um, the general trend that we saw in Kisau would be more adults closer towards deeper water with stronger currents. Um, I think that other people would certainly tell you that there is an ontogenetic shift in habitat use for Queen Kong, though. Um, and it tends to be juveniles remaining in a very large, in terms of abundance, um, aggregation that then once they, res they grow a large enough shell to be resistant to some predation, they spread out from there and start to be able to uh, utilize other habitats as well. All right, thank you. The next question is for any of the researchers. Are there any spawning aggregation areas known near Bimini for any variation of, for any various species? And can I please have those locations? It's my aim to, by recommendation, police these areas during closed season. And that's from Mr. Thomas Butler. Um, This is Dr. Gittens offhand. I don't know of any, but if any of our panelists 
can find out and share that information with me. I can share it with Mr. Butler. He's our officer, very capable person around Bimini, ready to act and support our management efforts. Um, Mr. Butler, as far as I know, uh, there used to be an active FSA for Nassau Grouper off Katki and Bimini, but that no longer forms that collapse. So I don't know of any other um, aggregations that have been reported around Bimini. Okay, so we, we're just going to ask a couple more questions before we wrap up. We just have a couple more. Um, and this next one is from Mr. James Haynes. And he says, is there, is there effort to protect KSAL as a conch nursery area for the larger Bahamas area? Can regulations or enforcement be tightened to assist conch recovery in other areas? I think this is a very poignant question. The, the Bahamas is getting ready to revise its conch management measures. And we intend to use protected areas as one of the ways to improve uh, our conch stocks. I found very, Dr. Carl's presentation very informative in that key cell actually replenishes Grand Bahama and Great Bahama Bank and a number of other areas. So in my mind, leaving from these presentations today that elevates the priority of protecting that area. Um, as it is, um, it's the Key Cell um, Management Park is up for expansion and the department or the government is intending to declare a number of protected areas this year still. And so we certainly will look at Dr. Carl's results and um, really and truly believe that protecting that area will help to replenish or at least um, have some sort of reserve in case things go wrong in other locations. All right, so next up, we have another one from Dr. Smith, and this one says, which life stage of queen conch is most sensitive to affecting total population growth or decline? Are there any protected areas around the KSAL bank considering how important it is as a potential source population in the region? Um, I guess I'll answer that by simply referring the second part of it to what Dr. Gibbs just um, informed us with regards to uh, reconsideration of management. Um, in terms of life stages and sensitivity, I think it could be argued that the adults are the most important to protect given that a single adult can produce um, many millions of eggs over the course of its life um, versus most juveniles get consumed anyways naturally through predation. All right, and this one's from Ms. Lynn Waterhouse and it's for Dr. Gittens. Do you recall if the Nassau group were caught in the lobster traps as bycatch were small in size, as in were they juveniles or below legal limits? Unfortunately, I am unable to say because the observer um, weighed all of them together and it was, I was unable to tell, but I, I suspect that two of the three that were caught in all were um, below the legal size. But I was informed by the observer as well that they were returned to the sea. And because it, the fishery is relatively shallow water as well, there, I don't think there were any issues with survival once they were released. All right, and our last question here says, um, do conch usually spend time around seagrasses? And that's for Dr. Cal. Um, conch can live in and around a variety of different marine habitats. Um, I think that juveniles and seagrass are uh, typically associated, um, but you can find adult conch near seagrass beds or on hard bottom, just chowing down on some macroalgae. Um, and even in the Exuma Keys Land and Sea Park, you find the highest densities um, around um, like octocoral and Gorgonian Plain. Okay, 
Alrighty, so that concludes um, our list of questions. I think I got everything was answered on our Facebook page, as well as in the Q&A section on our Zoom. So I just wanna say thank you to all our presenters that participated in our third week of the Bahamas Natural History Conference um, put on by the Bahamas National Trust. And also for all of the participants and stakeholders and just the general public tuning in, whether it was through our YouTube Live or our Facebook channel or via the Zoom, we deeply appreciate your participation and being engaged in this conference. Again, this year we would have been doing things differently, but of course, because of COVID, we are going virtual um, and we do appreciate you guys participating and, and um, um, doing these awesome presentations as well as giving good feedback and questions. So again, thank you all for participating and um, we will see you next week for our next session of the Bahamas Natural History Conference. Thank you, Jewel. Thank you, BNT panelists and all those who took part today.